supposed to shut up? Yeah, I don't get it. But is he talking? <laughs> right. So, great pleasure to introduce Jonathan. He did his uh, undergrad at Harvard, and then he did his PhD at Stanford in Biological Sciences with Philip Hanawalt studying the evolution of DNA repair. And then he moved to Tiger in 98 as an assistant investigator. And in 2000 to the present, he's also been an adjunct uh, faculty at John Hopkins. And in 2002, he became a full investor at Tiger. Throughout his career, he's been very interested in comparative genomics, particularly microbial genomics. And today, he's going to talk about phylogenomics and the mechanics of microbial diversification. Welcome to Davis. Thanks. And the, the axis of evolve. Um, which I confess I stole this title from someone else, um, but I'm going to use it for at least as long as Bush is president. Um, Hopefully, not very long. Yeah, well, you never know. There could be another one coming in the next election. Um, all right, so um, what I want to do is tell you about the work that um, I and my group have been doing relating to mechanisms of microbial diversification. I'm going to give a very brief introduction and then go through four... Um, related topics to, to this study of mechanisms of microbial diversification. I was here about a year and a half ago where I gave a talk where I'm going to cover a little bit of overlap with that talk, but I'm trying to introduce some of the, some different things relative to the talk I gave um, a year and a half ago. And then I'll give a little bit of a conclusion in future directions and where some of our analysis has led us to um, what we want to do in the future. So this is sort of the four general areas that we work on and really we're, we're we're interested in these areas primarily for the same reason, which is that we're interested in studying mechanisms of microbial diversification. So we study evolution of DNA repair and recombination processes, the genes, the processes themselves, and the systems, because those have a profound influence on the mutation rates, the mutation patterns, the rearrangement patterns, et cetera, in genomes. We're interested in genome dynamics themselves, so how have genomes changed over time? How have the, has the con content changed? How has the structure changed? And we're trying to connect that to our studies of evolution of DNA repair and recombination. We have, and I'll tell you a little bit about these, we have a couple of model systems that we think are very useful for studying um, the mechanisms of microbial diversification. And those are endosymbionts and extremophiles. And I'll tell you more about why we think those are really good models. And then we have a major interest in species evolution, primarily because understanding the relationships among all the organisms that we're studying is critical for interpreting the comparative studies that we're doing. And so there, just a little bit of a, a sort of list of some of the things that we're interested in, what types of data or what types of approaches we need in order to carry out these studies. So um, when we're studying the forces shaping genome structure and genome dynamics, the way we approach this is to try and gather or use complete genome sequences of organisms at different levels of evolutionary distance from each other and compare them. And for the closely related organisms, we can learn about rapidly changing features or mutation events. For the distantly related organisms, we can learn about general features of microbial evolution and genome structure. We're trying to link this um, in part to the actual diversification of the biology of organisms. So we're trying to use major evolutionary transitions in microbes and linking that to the changes in the genome structure. And as I mentioned before, the evolutionary phylogenetic diversification of organisms. And um, we're also interested in studying DNA repair processes. Most of what we do is trying to predict those DNA repair processes from genome sequences. And I'll tell you a little bit about trying to use experimental studies. So the general theme for all, almost all of the work we do is that um, we take an evolutionary approach to these studies. And there's this famous quote that lots of evolutionary biologists use in all their talks and books and things by Dubjansky. Um, and what I think Dubjansky really meant by this was that the evolutionary approach is really important for comparative studies. So it, you need to go beyond documenting the similarities and differences among organisms or among features or among genes to understanding the history behind how those similarities and differences came into being. So distinguishing between convergence and homology and distinguishing between certain patterns of processes, you need to understand the history, not just the similarities and differences that are there. And for better or worse, I invented my own omics word. Um, I apologize uh, for that. Uh, many years ago, I came up with this term phylogenomics, and I used it in a very particular way. But what I really mean by phylogenomics, and lots of other people use it, this term differently, is an integrated approach where you combine evolutionary reconstructions and genome analysis to um, 
study whatever you're interested in studying. And I think this integrated approach is necessary because there's a feedback loop between evolutionary reconstructions and genome analysis. So for example, if you're studying the evolution of a gene family or trying to predict the functions of genes, which I'll tell you about in a minute, it helps to first have a genome sequence of the organisms you're interested in, then to scan that genome sequence for the genes that you're interested in, homologs of those genes, but then to use an evolutionary analysis to divide a gene family into subfamilies or groups of orthologs to go back to the genome and look at the locations of those different orthologs within the genomes and paralogs, go back and do another evolutionary analysis so there's this loop where um, they're, they're not separate analyses, they have to be done together. So what I'm going to do now is take you through these four different related areas um, in what we work on. Um, and the first one is studies of genome dynamics. And I, just a little political plug here, um, this is a cartoon that came out right after the first announcement of the completion of the human genome. I think we're now on the fourth announcement of the completion of the human genome. Um, but uh, the most important point for what I'm interested in here is there's this picture of the human genome and there are gaps in it. So the, the genome was not actually complete and the cartoonist actually had knew this and made a little uh, point about this. But for most of the work that we do, it's very helpful to have complete genome sequence, closed, every single gap filled in in the genome sequence because we're interested in going down even to the single nucleotide and looking at patterns of rearrangement. We're looking at patterns of gene loss. So if you don't have the complete genome sequence, it's hard to study gene loss, et cetera. So it's very helpful to have um, complete genome sequences. And e although in principle I'd be interested in studying all of these things for all sorts of types of organisms, the best collection of complete genome sequences that are available right now are in prokaryotes. And so for most of our studies, we've only been able to do a lot of the things we're interested in by studying prokaryotes. So um, the last time I was here, I talked extensively about um, some of these different things that we've used comparative genomics to learn about. So we've studied gene duplication processes. We've uh, learned about uh, where the duplicate genes within prokaryotic genomes come from. We've used studies of these duplications to make predictions of functions of genes. We've studied uh, lateral gene transfer among organisms. We've actually spent some of our time, unfortunately, having to refute what we think are bad studies of lateral gene transfer um, done by other people, such as claims in the human genome. But what we're really interested in using studies of lateral gene transfer for is looking in eukaryotic genomes for genes that are in the nucleus but were derived from the organeller genome. So they once were in the organelles and they've been transferred to the nucleus. And this is very useful if you want to predict what the function or targeting of genes is in the nuclear genomes of eukaryotes. Because many of these genes that once were in the organelles and are now in the nucleus still function in organelle biology. So if you can identify genes that are derived from the organelle genomes by some type of evolutionary and comparative analysis, you can, it helps you identify candidates that might be functioning in organelle biology. And what I'm going to tell you about um, is a story uh, uh, of a study of genome rearrangement um, by looking at comparative genomics. And, oh, I forgot I have this out of order. Um, so I, I first have to tell you how we go about doing these studies. And so one of the things we, at least for visualizing the comparison of genomes, we do these genome dot plots with a variety of methods. We can plot all genes in a genome against all genes in another genome. We can plot, uh, do whole genome alignments of different genomes with each other. But the way this works is, um, for those of you who don't uh, work on prokaryotes, there are a couple of important things here. Many of the genomes in prokaryotes are circular, not all of them, but most of them are. And prokaryotic DNA replication happens in this bidirectional process where it starts at an origin of replication and then the replication happens in both directions from the origin of replication and then there's a region near the end that serves as the terminus of DNA replication. And this is particularly important for what I'm going to tell you about in a minute. But when we do these dot plots, we have to linearize these genomes to, to do the dot plots. So basically, we broke, break them open at the origin of replication. So here's the origin in this linear plot. The terminus is right in the middle, and then you're back at the origin again at the end of the linear plot. And so if you do a dot plot of two closely related genomes, what you would see is a, a nice diagonal because they have conserved gene order between them. Here's the origin of both of the genomes. Here's the terminus of both of the genomes. And you're back at the origin again, the end of the dot plot. So sorry, I've got to go back one slide. Um, so this is a dot plot of the Vibrio cholera genome against the E. coli, Vibrio cholera chromosome 1 against the E. coli uh, main chromosome. And it's a plot of all the genes in the two chromosomes, blast searched. 
against each other and then plot the chromosome location of each gene and the chromosome locations of each homolog of those genes in the other genome. And there's a lot of noise here. So there's lots of homologs of many of these genes because there are many gene families in E. coli like ABC transporters and a few other things where there are dozens or hundreds of homologs of the Vibrio gene in the E. coli genome. So if you take this plot, sorry, I gotta skip over, and you weed out everything but the best hit for each of the genes in the genome, you remove a lot of this sort of background noise of the locations of paralogous genes, and now you can see that there's some sort of clustering of hits in the middle of this plot. You can see even better there's some conserved gene order between these two genomes over here. And if you go one step further and actually try and identify orthologs between the two genomes, these are genes that are related to each other by speciation events rather than genes that are related by duplication events, you remove even more of the noise. So this is one of the ways that this evolutionary feedback loop helps you study genome sequences by identifying orthologs rather than all paralogs between genomes. You can weed out a lot of the noise, and you see this strange angel of death-like pattern when we first uh, observed this, that we weren't quite sure what to make of it until we realized we made a mistake in this plot. And we hadn't actually tried to identify the origins of replication, in particular in the Vibrio cholera chromosome. When we did that and then made the plot, now you see this X background. There's a little, there's some noise here, but you can see clustering of the genes along the two diagonals, this X-like shape. And we stared at this over and over and over again. We even presented it at a meeting without an explanation for it. Um, and we eventually came up with two models that could explain this pattern. So the important thing here is that you have a gene in Vibrio cholera. And if you ask where is the, homo the ortholog of that gene in E. coli, it's either on the same side of the origin of replication in your, however you split open the genome for E. coli, or it's on the opposite side of the origin of replication. The distance that that gene is from the origin of replication is highly conserved, but the side that it's on is not. That's the critical observation here. So the question is, how would this happen? How would you get this um, conservation of chromosome location, of distance from the origin, but not the side? So we came up with two models. One of them, which I won't, won't belabor because we're pretty sure it's wrong, is that there's an ancient duplication of the genome in the ancestor of Vibrio cholera and E. coli, or sometime in its history, an inverted duplication of this genome. And then as the genomes evolve after they diverge, and you plot the chromosome locations of genes against each other, you would see this X slide shape. An alternative, which I will show you some uh, evidence that we think is the correct explanation is that you have inversions that pivot around the origin of replication. So here's a circular genome. If there's an inversion that pivots symmetrically around the origin of replication, the location a gene is from the origin of replication will be maintained, but the side that it's on will not be. And you will get, um, initially you will see a single inversion when one event occurs and then another event you get this starting to break apart and more events you get, start to get this X-like structure. Um, so here's the amazing thing. Basically every pair of closely related prokaryotic genomes, bacteria and archaea that you look at, at show this pattern. This is not limited to E. coli or a subset of prokaryotes. This is everything, archaea, Low GC gram positives, high GC gram positives, other types of proteobacteria, it's in everything, everywhere we look. So this is some universal property of the evolution of prokaryotic genomes, this symmetrical inversion around the origin of replication. So what are the explanations for this? Well, it turns out actually um, a, a few people, John Roth included uh, among them, had done some experiments in Salmonella and E. coli and some of their relatives because they had observed this type of patter pattern somewhat in some of these organisms by comparative uh, genetic approaches. You could see that certain types of inversions occurred and other types of inversions did not appear to occur. But now we've observed that this is universal across everything. But so what, why would this happen? So one possibility is that there's selection against other types of inversions. So you get all types of inversions and maybe only the symmetric ones survive or mostly the symmetric ones survive. So there are two reasons why this might occur. The distance a gene is from the origin of replication in prokaryotes actually affects the number of copies of that gene in the genome. They're constantly replicating their chromosomes. So at any one point, genes that are closer to the origin of replication actually have a higher dosage within the cell than genes that are near the terminus. 
and maybe the gene dosage is important. Um, another very important thing is that when you have an inversion that's not symmetric about the origin of replication, you change the relative orientation of transcription relative to replication. And there are many experimental studies that have shown that colliding DNA polymerase and RNA polymerase running in the opposite directions of each other can be detrimental. So maybe there's some selection against those inversions that change the relative orientation of transcription to DNA replication. An alternative um, is that maybe the symmetrical inversions are more likely to occur. That is, it's not a selective argument that you have a mutation bias and the symmetric inversions are more likely to occur. As I said before, the D way DNA replication works in prokaryotes, it starts from an origin of replication and spreads in both directions around the circle. So if something disrupts DNA replication at any particular point during this process, the polymerase will be equidistant on each side of the origin of replication. If, for example, there are strand breaks or if something else occurs and now the polymerases start back up, grabbing the wrong strand, you get an inversion. If there's some type of recombination event that's activated by this, you will get an asymmetric inversion around the origin. So there are these two, uh, probably both of these things are occurring in some of the organisms that we're looking at, but we actually don't know universally across prokaryotes which of these is the more complete explanation, explains more of these observations. So what we're trying to do right now is take the vast amount of prokaryotic genomes that are out there, compare all of them to each other, every possible pair of comparisons, and look for whether or not there are any organisms that have unusual features with their X that they get, or um, don't fit on the X at all, or, um, or what. And so what I'm going to show you is some, some interesting things that people, we and others, are starting to observe. So here's a plot of Vibrio cholera versus Vibrio parahemolyticus, um, the main chromosome. The, Vibrio has two chromosomes, chromosome one and chromosome two. So you see this amazing X-like structure for this plot. Um, but if you look at the second chromosome in Vibrio, you barely see a detectable X. Actually, it's there. We've done, the, you know, you can see there's a little bit along this diagonal and a little bit along this diagonal. So what's probably going on here is that the rate of change, the rate of inversions in the chromosome two is much greater than the rate in chromosome one. Oh, sorry, the red and green just are the relative orientation of the strands for the plot. It's not. Um, it's just because this analysis was done with Mummer, a whole genome alignment tool at the DNA level, and the other ones were done at, by protein-protein blast. And so we distinguish whether it's the positive or negative alignment for Mummer, but it, it, they're, they're identical in, in, for this purpose. And so what we're going to try and do is compare these two chromosomes to each other and try and figure out why one might be evolving at a higher rate, have a higher rate of these changes than the other. We, we don't actually have any idea. It could be something to do with uh, the number of repeat sequences on this chromosome. It, we, we don't know. Um, here's another example where um, something sort of the opposite is going on. In endosymbionts of aphids, the Buchnera species, these organisms have no inversions that ever occur, basically, at least so far that have been observed, that whatever pairs of these genomes that you look at, they're perfectly syntenic. These organisms are missing Rec A, the homologous recombination enzyme. Um, they have no homolog of that, and it appears that they have no homologous recombination. So it probably means that homologous recombination, we're not surprised by this, but it probably means that homologous recombination is required to have these inversions occur. Now, we're, you know, obviously that hasn't been tested experimentally, but so we're comparing all of these genomes of prokaryotes to each other to try and identify exceptions to the rules that we've observed. And then we're going to go in and try and characterize those particular organisms in more detail, either with experimental studies or with more fine-tuned bioinformatics or by gathering more genome sequence data. Um, so that's sort of one side of what we work on, is trying to do these comparisons to identify features of genome evolution that we can then, hopefully with experimental or other studies, correlate to the mechanisms that are going on in those organisms. So what I want to tell you about is a uh, second side of things, which is these model systems that I referred to before um, with extremophiles and endosymbionts, and why we're interested in gathering and analyzing genome data of these organisms in particular relative to all the prokaryotes that are out there. So there are many reasons why we want to do this for extremophiles. In particular, we're doing a lot of work on thermophilic organisms. And there are a lot of reasons why thermophiles are very interesting in terms of genome evolution. One of them that we're particularly interested in is that when you have a selective pressure of growing at a very high temperature, 
um, all the proteins in the genome, or most of them, are selected for changing their amino acid content, changing their folding kinetics, changing their hydrophobicity, changing a lot of the features of their structure in order to survive at these higher temperatures. This basically means that we have thousands of samples of the response to a particular selective pressure within one genome sequence. And so this allows us to do some tests of how organisms respond to selective pressures with large data sets at one time by analyzing one genome. Um, another reason I'm interested in extreme files is that many of the environments that they live in also induce a large amounts of DNA damage and people don't quite understand how they're able to survive those high levels of DNA damage. What I'm going to tell you about in more detail are our studies of endosymbionts. And these are, so these are primarily, right now, we're working on intracellular bacteria. They live inside the cells of eukaryotic organisms. And the ones we focus on are mutualistic symbionts, so they're not parasites usually. Um, they provide some benefit to the host that they live in. And so one of the reasons we're interested in this is they're good models for studies of organelle evolution. They're sort of the, maybe the step before something becomes an organelle. They live inside their host. They're a mutualistic symbiont. Many of them have thrown away large portions of their genome like the organelles have done, but they haven't crossed some threshold to become what we would call uh, an organelle. Um, in terms of their evolution. So they may be more recently evolved, and we can get a glimpse of how organelle evolution may have occurred. This genome reduction that they undergo is very useful for our studies because frequently they throw away DNA repair genes as part of their DNA genome reduction. We're not sure whether or not this is an adaptive response to their environments. It doesn't really matter for the studies we're doing. The fact that they lose some of these DNA repair genes, like I told you Buchnera lost the RecA homologs, gives us samples of organisms and their evolution um, without particular DNA repair genes. So they, they can allow us to test whether or not those DNA repair genes and maybe the processes that they encode affect the long-term evolution of the chromosome structure and the evolution of these organisms. So there's one big problem with the studies of both of these types of organisms in that most of the ones that are interesting or important have never been grown in pure culture in the laboratory. And so we need methods to go about studying them that um, are separate from the methods that people use when they culture organisms and do standard experiments. And so there have basically been two questions that people have asked when they're studying both any type of environmental organism. So most of the microbes on the planet have never been cultured. Um, this is also true for the endosymbionts and extreme files. And there are two main questions people would like to get at. Who's out there? Just in any particular environment, if you can't culture everything that's there, you need a method to figure out who is living out there in the environment. And what are they doing? If we can't grow them in the lab and do the standard experiments, we need a way to figure out what they're doing. So the main method that people have been using since the 1980s um, to figure out who is out there is by PCR amplifying the small subunit of ribosome RNA from these organisms because they're very good universal PCR primers that you can use sequencing those ribosome RNAs that you get from an environmental sample, building a phylogenetic tree of those ribosome RNAs, and comparing your environmental sample to other environmental samples or cultured organisms, and placing your sequences on this tree of ribosome RNA sequences. And that basically tells you what phylogenetic groups of organisms you're looking at. This is an old study I did as an undergraduate on some uh, chemosynthetic symbiotic bacteria that live inside, in this case, a bivalve called Solomyovelum. We PCR amplified the 16S ribosome RNA, built this tree. It's in a clade with other chemosynthetic symbionts of various marine invertebrates. And the critical thing for then going beyond who is out there and trying to figure out what they're doing at the time was to find the closest, the most closely related cultured organism to this group of uncultured organisms and try and leverage the biological studies of that cultured organism to your uncultured organism. So in this case, it was an organism called Thiomicrospira. At the time, it was the most closely related cultured organism to our uncultured organisms. And so here's the big problem that everybody who works on these ribosome RNA studies was confronted with. The biology of these organisms is not similar enough to make useful predictions based upon the position in the ribosome RNA tree. It's probably because bacteria evolve incredibly rapidly, their physiology, their biochemistry, et cetera, and this relationship in the ribosome RNA tree, it tells us what phylogenetic group of bacteria these are, but very little about their biology. And so people have turned to going after the genome sequences of these uncultured organisms to hopefully aid in predicting the biology of these organisms. Um, and so 
we believe endosymbionts are an excellent way to sort of test these studies of uncultured organisms by genome sequencing because we can actually get very enriched samples of particular endosymbionts at, for sequencing their genomes and therefore with relatively few number of sequencing reactions and therefore relatively low cost can actually complete the genomes of some of these endosymbionts using standard shotgun sequencing methods that have been used for all the other cultured microbial genomes. So I'm just going to tell you very briefly about a couple of endosymbiont studies that we've done by sequencing the complete genomes of organisms. Um, we sequenced the genome of this organism called Wolbachia pipientis. Um, Wolbachia are rickettsia-like bacteria that live inside a huge diversity of invertebrate organisms. Most of them have this special feature that makes them really interesting to evolutionary biologists in that they target males for negative effects. They're maternally transmitted and they've evolved these means to get rid of the males in the population basically. They can either kill them, they can make the females reproduce parthenogenically, they can make the males that are produced sterile. There's a diversity of effects that Wolbachia have in these populations of organisms and that makes them really interesting for studying the evolution of sex determination or the effects of sex ratio biases in populations. And um, we sequenced the genome of Wolbachia that infects a nice model organism, Drosophila melanogaster. Um, we believe greatly in trying to do genomes of organisms that you can then follow up with experimental studies. And we found some very unusual things in the genome of this Wolbachia that infects uh, Drosophila melanogaster. And the most important thing that we found in terms of the evolution of the genome of this Wolbachia is that most intracellular bacteria, when you, um, people have sequenced their genomes, including both pathogens and mutualistic symbionts, but even more so for mutualistic symbionts, they have thrown away a lot of their genome. And in addition, they generally throw away all the repetitive sequences, all the transposable elements. They're gone. The, and there are a lot of theories that have been tried to suggest to explain this. The one I, I like the most is that there may be some sort of selection for streamlining these genomes, making them relatively small. And therefore, if there's a transposable element that's constantly replicating within these genomes, there's strong selective pressure against that. And eventually, the organisms, the, the ones that have gotten rid of the transposable elements have a higher fitness and they've spread in the populations. Whereas free living organisms, there may not be that selection against the spread of these transposable elements. So the Wolbachia genome, a very small genome, 1.2 million base pairs, was literally overrun with repeat sequences and transposable elements. 15, maybe 20% of the genome was uh, included in repeat sequences and most of these appeared to be various classes of transposable elements. So uh, that has uh, two important things. It suggests to us that selection may be inefficient. There are a lot of other reasons why we concluded this. May be inefficient in Wolbachia. So there may be still selection for the streamlining, but it, for whatever reason, Wolbachia is unable to get rid of these repeat sequences because the selection is inefficient. A second thing that this does is it causes um, the genome of Wolbachia to evolve very differently from the genomes of other um, endosymbiotic bacteria. And uh, this is not a plot of complete genomes, but this is another one of these dot plots with the uh, 70 KB fragment from another Wolbachia that was available at the time versus our genome. And you see these little regions of conserved DNA sequence order that are represented here, and then lots of breaks where these repeat sequences are. So these repeat sequences basically shred the genomes of Wolbachia in terms of creating all sorts of rearrangements. And in fact, the Wolbachia that we've been able to look at so far don't seem to have a good X-like alignment. And it may be that there are just too many rearrangements everywhere in the genome with selection being inefficient possibly in the Wolbachia. The other types of inversions aren't efficiently selected against and you get all sorts of types of inversions. So this is a way that sequencing the genome and analyzing the genome of an organism gives us some predictions about the selection and the biology of the organism as well as some understanding of the evolution. I don't know if people saw there was this paper that actually my brother at Berkeley was involved in where they went through the genome sequences of various insects that are being sequenced at various genome centers and they found a lot of Wolbachia data in those uh, shotgun sequence for the host. And they were actually able to assemble uh, the genomes of a lot of these Wolbachia. The only reason this worked was they assembled it against our scaffold of a complete genome of another strain of Wolbachia. So having a scaffold sequence of a particular representative of a group of uncultured organisms is very valuable for then studying other 
uncultured organisms in that same group. Um, I'm not going to tell you a lot of detail about this because um, it's still a work in progress, but we've been working with Nancy Moran, who's at the University of Arizona, um, on sequencing the genome of the symbionts of the glassy wing sharpshooter, which I assume most people around here have heard of. No one in the East Coast has heard of it. Um, but it's the vector for Pierce's disease in grapes. And it's even, well, in the East Coast, I always emphasize that it's listed by DHS as a potential agroterrorism agent. Um, so um, like many sap feeding insects, the glassy wing sharpshooter has symbionts that live inside of it, specialized cells in it that are nutritional. They supplement the nutrition of the host because the amino acid content or the other content of the sap that they're feeding on is insufficient for all the things it needs. The Buchnera endosymbionts I talked about before are of aphids, and they do that for aphids. So when we sequence the genome of this primary symbiont, which is actually called Baumania cicatolinicola, after Paul Bauman, who's here at Davis, um, it, it turns out to be very different from the other nutritional symbionts of Buchnera, at least, of some of the insects that have been looked at. And then it does not appear to have a lot of the amino acid synthesis pathways that are present in these Buchnera. Instead, it has these cofactor and vitamin synthesis pathways. And it may be that that's what's not present in the things that the sharpshooter is feeding on and what it needs the symbiont to make up for in its um, biology. And so um, there's a problem that we ran into in studying this sharpshooter symbiont um, in that there were a bunch of uh, amino acid synthesis pathways that we thought it should also have because they should be absent from the food that it's feeding on and are the ones that the host can't make itself. And these pathways were incomplete. And it turns out in the same tissue where we got the DNA for the primary symbiont, there are other symbionts living there. Nancy Moran and um, uh, many people have been studying these using ribosomal RNA-based techniques. And they've actually been able to figure out what types of bacteria some of these other symbionts are that live inside the sharpshooter or live inside other types of insects. And here we have a problem. We have a large sample of this primary symbiont because it's most of the bacterial DNA from the sample. We were able to finish its genome. Then we have these much rarer other symbionts that live in the same sample. We just have a few sequence reads out of the tens of thousands we did that came from this organism. How do we figure out which ones came from the cytophaga-like organism, which ones come from Wolbachia, which are also present in the sample that we worked on, which ones come from protists that appear to be in the sample, which ones come from yeast, that also are in the sample, how do we figure that out? What we do is use phylogenetic analysis like with the ribosomal RNA, but with every gene that we can get our hands on in these samples. And if we find genes that are robust phylogenetic markers, we can then hopefully assign them to particular phylogenetic groups. Doesn't matter if it's ribosomal RNA or not. It could be Rec A, elongation factors, RPOB, et cetera. And very briefly, I'm not going to we're going to skip over this in the interest of time. So I'm, I'm not going to tell you about how we did this for the sharpshooter symbiont because that's still a work in progress. Um, sorry, I'm going to actually uh, indulge me for a second. Before I tell you about how we did this for another sample, I want to tell you about what we're doing with uh, other types of symbionts. Um, so we're doing this nutritional symbiont of the sharpshooter. We're doing these Wolbachia, which in some cases are parasitic. In other cases, Wolbachia are mutualistic symbionts. What we're really interested in is getting the diversity of symbionts that are out there, characterizing their genomes, and trying to use comparative studies of them to understand mechanisms of organellar evolution, mechanisms of mutualistic symbiosis evolution, and maybe identify more cases where they're missing or have extra copies of particular DNA repair genes. Um, in their genomes that will be good candidates for further studies of the mechanisms of genome evolution. And so um, there are lots of bacterial symbionts that live inside various hosts that are out there on the planet, all sorts of diverse biology. We've just started on trying to work on some additional ones. So we've got a grant from NSF to sequence two of these chemosynthetic endosymbionts from deep sea types of organisms. And in fact, what we're doing in this case is comparing the genomes of a vertically transmitted symbiont. These are ones transmitted from mothers to their offspring to the genome of a, what seems to be a similar biology. It's a hydrogen sulfide using chemosynthetic bacteria, but it's transmitted environmentally. It infects its host every generation in a larval stage. And this maternal transmission versus vertical transmission should create different population genetic effects and different selective pressures. And maybe these genomes have evolved in different ways because of their different modes of transmission. We're also doing a, 
chemosynthetic symbiont that actually, rather than living inside the cells of, an organi of its host, it lives on the outside of the host. So it's an epibiont. So now we're going to try and compare this genome and how it's evolved to these endosymbiont genomes to try and understand whether or not there's a difference that goes on with a mutualistic symbiont that lives on the outside versus a mutualistic symbiont that lives on the inside of these organisms. And uh, a similar question that we're working on is this organism called Prochloron, which is a photosynthetic symbiont of a chordate. So there are very few um, mutualistic symbionts of chordates that have, endosymbionts of chordates that have been studied. Um, and so this is a photosynthetic symbiont that lives inside of this um, primitive, deeply branching chordate. And so we're going to try and use the genome to understand whether or not something different happens in invertebrates, um, in insects, for example, or worms or clams versus this deeply branching chordate. Um, so coming back to this problem that we have in all of these studies, and all of the studies of uncultured organisms, uh, is how do we map the DNA that we get from an environmental sample if we're not actually able to close the genome of the organism, as we've been able to do with the sharpshooter symbiont and the Wolbachia symbiont and some of these other ones. So we have these more complex samples, and we'd like to figure out who all of the pieces of DNA come from in that environmental sample. And so most of the people that have been doing studies like this, there's a whole field, some people call it metagenomics, environmental genomics, um, shotgun environmental genomics. There are a large number of names that apply to this field. Most of the people who have been doing this have been relying upon ribosomal RNA to try and be an anchor within particular fragments from your environmental sample because there's 